Welcome to E Sikshana in uh, collaboration with VTU. Today I am here again to continue with water supply and sanitation, which is part of Building Services 18 ARC 43 2018 scheme. Uh, in the previous two classes, I was talking about uh, how exactly we are going to, uh, you know, have certain considerations with environment and health aspects, and then I brought in water supply, and then told you a little about what exactly makes water and then uh, the components of water and then the sources of water. Today we are going to talk about uh, the quality, uh, quantity of water and how exactly we estimate the quantity of water. To estimate quantity and access the quantity of water, it is very difficult because for a town, the factors that we are going to consider with respect to the water supply schemes is the present as well as the future demands of any settlement. There are many variable factors which actually affect the water consumption. However, there are certain thumb rules and empirical formula which are used to get a fairly accurate idea about water consumptions. For water supply scheme, demand has to be taken in terms of the well, uh, in terms of the demand of the next 20 to 40 years. So, demand calculations have to be considerate of the population of the present as well as the projected population of 20 to 40 years. This involves determination of the design period, <coughs> which is basically about how long are we going to work on the construction of dams, reservoirs, treatment works, as well as the network of distribution pipelines. And these wall works have to be replaced easily or capacities to be increased conveniently for any kind of future expansion. While designing and constructing these works, we should also think about the sufficient capacity of the future demand of the town for the number of years. The number of years for which the design of the water has been done is also called as design period and mostly all the water works are designed for a design period of 20 to 40 years, which is fairly a good period. The next factor is population determination. So, when the design period is fixed to 20 to 40 years, now what we have to think about is determine the population of the town or a city. It is one of the most important factors in planning. And the population to be served with the scheme for a certain design period of the project is estimated by various forecasting methods like the arithmetical increase method, geometrical increase method, incremental increase method, simple graph method, decrease rate of growth method, comparative graph method as well as the master plan method. So, either of the uh, options can be chosen for us to actually forecast the population and then understand the methodological approach. The third factor is the per capita demand. The total consumption of water which depends on various factors such as climatic conditions, cost of water and the standard of living has to be considered and we should also try to understand in detail the requirement of water for various purposes like domestic, industrial, agricultural, etc. The total estimated quantity should be divided by population to give us a per capita demand and try to understand what exactly is the third factor here. So, design period, population determination and per capita demand. So, these are the three factors upon which we start thinking about how exactly we can estimate on the quantity of water for the uses of water. What are the different uses of water now? If you actually understand water, water is considered to be the purest form of water which is given for domestic use. It should possess highest degree of purity. It should also be free of suspended impurities, any kind of bacteria and small degree of hardness is permissible in it. In domestic use, when we are talking about pure and potable and wholesome water, we are basically talking of water which is colorless, odorless as well as clear. It is free from suspended, soluble and colloidal impurities, it is free from sediments, fresh and tasty, free from harmful organisms, 
free from radioactive substances, free from hardnesses and free from poisonous and corrosive substances. When all these factors are given into consideration, then that water can be utilized as domestic water. Then the next usage is the civic use, where uh, the water is used for washing roads, cleaning of sewers. Here the quantity of water is required in larger numbers, a certain degree of impurity can be tolerated and water containing suspended and dissolved impurities can also be permitted in terms of civic usage. Trade or business usage, this depends on the nature of trade, laundry uses uh, this kind of water where you need clear, soft and free from iron kind of water for stables where animals are kept may contain impurities. For artificial silk, clear, bright and free from color water is used. For concrete, clean and free from sulphates and chlorides because it reacts with all the iron that is there in the buildings. And for dairies, you have to make um, the water to be free from bacterial purity. Next is commercial or industrial use, this should be chemically pure, chemical processes involves uh, in the production processes of the industries, slight amount of impurity may affect the final results of the product. So, you have to be very careful of the impervious products that comes in uh, in the factories, because the factories install most of their water supply plants to seed their needs. Depending on what exactly is the need, uh, the process of the water treatment is installed within the factory premises. And following are the various type of water demands in a city or a town. With respect to domestic water demand, we have almost 35 percent. So, 35 percent is a good amount of water that is actually used by a residential purpose. For industrial demand and commercial demand, we have around 30 percent and then for public usage that is for civic usage 10 percent, institution fire and miscellaneous losses and waste comes under the 25 percent of the uh, usage. So, public use basically includes water which is needed for gardens, fountains, cascades, swimming pools, firefighting requirements, plantation, landscaping, etcetera. Miscellaneous includes wastage and loss through distribution networks, if there are any leakages in the infiltrations, if there is something that is happening under the you know ground and without our notice, then that falls under the miscellaneous part. Now, what is the demand? When we are looking, looking into the sources, we know that there is a, a domestic uh, uh, source of water, we also know that there is civic use of water and then there is industrial and trade and commerce and all. Now, we have to also understand the demand that is needed. The quantity of water which is required in all these houses on the residential houses is basically for drinking, bathing, cooking, washing. So, this is called as domestic water demand. Now, this mainly depends upon habits, social statuses, climatic conditions and customs. As per the Indian standards, under normal conditions, the domestic consumption of water in India is about 135 liters per day per capita. But in developed countries, this figure may be 350 liters per day per capita because of the use of air coolers, air conditioners, maintenance of lawns automatic household appliances. But since we are not very dependent on all of them, 135 is sufficient enough for a normal usage. So, details of the domestic consumption are for drinking, we use 5 liters, for cooking 5 liters, for bathing 55 liters, for washing of clothes 20 liters, utensils 10 liters, cleaning of your house 10 liters, total 135 liters. So, <coughs> so, 135 liters per day per capita is what uh, the whole uh, one person's consumption is. The industrial demand is basically whatever depends on the type of industries which are existing in the city. If the city needs uh, 
has a lot of factories which are related to paper mills, cloth mills, cotton mills, then they all come under industrial usage and totally depending upon what kind of usage around 20 to 25 percent of water is the total demand of the city. For institution and commercial like universities, institutions and any commercial center inclusive of office buildings, warehouses, stores, hotels, shopping centers, health centers fall under this category alongside railway station, bus stands and any public space like cinema houses, temples and schools and health centers. As per the Indian standards, again for the public buildings other than residences, we actually have almost like wherever there are bathrooms, we need at least 45 liters per day. Wherever there are no bathrooms with respect to factories, 30 liters are sufficient. With respect to hospitals, 450 to 340 is required depending on the number of beds. For nursing homes, 135 liters. For hostels, 135 again. For offices, 45. Restaurants, 70 and cinema concerts and theatres per seat at least 15 litres. For schools 45 litres, for gardens, sports grounds 35 and for animals and vehicles we need at least 45. The public usage demand is basically again for purposes such as washing and sprinkling on roads, cleaning of sewers, watering of public parks, gardens, public fountains. Now, at least 5 percent of the total consumption is made designing the water works for a city. So, the requirement is for at least 1.4 liters for public parks, 1 to 1.5 liters for street washing and 4 and a half liters for sewer cleaning. The fire demand, fire which may play, take place due to faulty electric wires or by short circuiting. Fire catching happens because of unforeseen unhappenings, mishappenings. If fires are not properly controlled and extinguished in minimum possible time, they lead to serious damages and may burn the cities. So, to break down the large quantity of water is required for throwing it over the fire to extinguish it. So, at least we need to keep some kind of water as reserve for this purpose. In most of the cities, fire hydrants are provided on the water mains at 100 to 150 meters apart for fire demand and the quantity of water required is generally calculated using different empirical formula. For Indian conditions, we use this where Q is quantity of water required in liters and P is population. So, 3182 square root of the population which is uh, number of people in thousands gives us the amount of water that is needed for us to keep in reserve. <coughs> losses and waste. So, the demand for losses and waste is at least allowing 15 percent to of the total quantity of water for uh, any unauthorized or illegal connections. If people do not close down their taps and you know they are not even using the water and loving continuous wastage of water and all this water which comes from the distribution goes into waste without reaching the consumers. So, at least 15 percent of the total quality of water falls under the demand for losses and waste. So, per capita demand of each town depends on various factors like standard of living, number and type of commercial and industrial places in a town. Now, as we all know at least for a city we need 2 lit 70 liters per capita per day depending on the domestic, industrial, public, fire and losses and wastage. So, annual demand is calculated based on the rate of consumption which is <coughs> L into C into D multi uh, multiplied by 365 days and multiplied by the number of people that is there. So, per capita demand is basically total quantity of water which is required by various purposes by a town per year and P is the population of the town. Then per capita demand will be per capita demand is total quantity of water divided by population into number of days in a year so many liters per day. If you actually understand this 
then we can actually calculate as to what exactly is the demand of each of the town before we start working on integrating the whole water supply system for it. According to the health ministry, the total demand to incorporate for demand of water for fire forwarding purpose is calculated based on 0.21 into 4.54 into 10 times 6 liters. <coughs> So, what are the fluctuations that happen with respect to the rate of demand? When we know that there is a demand for water, we also know that there are variations in terms of seasons. So, when seasonal variations happen like the demand perks during summers, but during um, winter we do not need so much of water. There might be a fire break which is generally there during summers. So, there is seasonal variation here. Also daily variation like festival days when you are going to um, use a lot of water for all your consumption and people draw out more water on Sundays and there is an increasing demand on all these days. Otherwise hourly variations, this is also very important to have a wide range because during all these active household working hours that is from 6 to 10 in the morning and 4 to 8 in the evening, the bulk of the daily requirement is taken into consideration. During other hours, the requirement is negligible. Moreover, if a fire breaks out, a huge quantity of water is required to be supplied during short uh, duration. So, a maximum rate of hourly supply should be thought of in terms of rate of demand. Also, you have to also think about the peak demand to meet all the fluctuations that happen with respect to supply pipes, service reservoirs and distribution pipes because we have to proportion them properly and try to understand how we are going to pump it out directly and how are we designing the whole peak demand. The effect of monthly variation also influences the design of the storage reservoirs because based on the storage reservoirs we are going to have hourly variations which are going to work on the influence of the design of pumps as well as service reservoirs. The daily and hourly variation water demand basically is worked on these calculations. For a daily water demand on an average in million liters, we work it out with respect to population times water demand. In terms of maximum daily water demand, we work it out in terms of 1.5 times population times the water demand that is all calculated with respect to so many liters per capita per day or maximum hourly water demand is 2.5 times population times water demand. So, the total water daily demand in a city is calculated in terms of maximum daily water demand plus water for firefighting. So, you should always keep this in mind that with respect to any kind of water consumption, we always have to keep a certain amount of water for firefighting. And then we have to also think about maximum hourly water demand which is basically going to work in terms of what exactly is the adoption facility that we are going to work in terms of the demand of water. The following are also certain factors which work on the per capita demand of the city like climatic conditions. The quantity of water required in hotter and dry places is more than cold countries because here we use air coolers, we use air conditioners, we also sprinkle water on lawns, gardens, courtyards. But in very cold countries because of the climate, we do not use so much of water there because people often keep their taps open and, what <clears throat> and there is fear of freezing of water in the taps and use of hot water for keeping the rooms warm. So, we have to also think about the size of the community. Water demand is more with increase of the size in terms of this town or a city because more water is required in street washing, running of sewers and maintenance of parks and gardens. The living standard of people also is one major factor in terms of developing the per capita demand of the town because there as the standards of living keep increasing, their gardens increase, they are uh, you know open spaces increase when that happens along with it comes their air conditioners that is the products which they use which they are dependent on with respect to the flushing of latrines and automatic home appliances also use a lot of water. 
industrial and commercial activities enormously increase the per capita demand of the town. So, we have to understand as to what exactly is the industrial backing of a city in terms of the direct link with the population of the town. And the kind of city that the pressure that the city has, the rate of water consumption increases with terms of the building and even with the required pressure at the farthest point. So, you have to understand as to how much water is freely available when compared to water that is scarcely available and then more water loss which could happen that is plus and minus loss of water with respect to wastage or leakage. And um, the next factor is system of sanitation per capita demand of the towns having water carriage system will be more than the town in which their system is not being used. The cost of water directly affects the demand. So, if the cost of water is more less quantity of water will be used by the people as compared to when the cost is low. Now, how do we figure out quality? Until now, we were talking about quantity and the per capita demand and how exactly we are going to configure upon the different types of demands that we have in the market. Now, based on everything comes basically on the quality of water. So, what is quality of water? When we are talking about quality of water, we are basically talking about the impurities in water and the quality of potable water, the hard and soft water and its treatment. What is potable water? What is wholesome water? The potable water is something that does not contain any harmful impurities and does not contain any other salt, but it is good for consumption, it is good for health and unharmful for health. So, that is what is called as wholesome water. In other words, wholesome water is that water which is not chemically pure, but does not contain anything harmful to us. The following are the requirements of potable water. The water should be free from diseases which produce bacteria. The water should be colorless, odorless and clear. Water should be fresh and tasty. Water should not corrode all the pipes and other fittings and it should be free from harmful salts and other objectionable matter. The water should be absolutely pure and it should never be found in nature because if you have it in uh, nature, it contains a lot of impurities in varying amounts. So, you have to keep in mind that you have to also think about the kind of water that is pure. The rain water which is originally pure also absorbs all the gases, dust and other impurities which fall. This makes the ground water, um, you know, table to have salt, organic and inorganic impurities within it. So, this water before supplying to the public should always be treated and purified for the safety of public health, economy as well as production uh, and protection of various industrial processes. It is the most essential for water work engineers to thoroughly check, analyze and do the treatment of raw water obtained from the sources before its distribution. Actually, if you understand purification of water, it is absolute necessary for us because certain dissolved salts are good for health also and they make the water tasteful. But when you treat it, all these water salts get dissolved and it does not come under our consumption levels. So, when we miss out on all these salts, we might also be losing out on some parts of our health. So, it will be very considerate in terms of understanding what exactly is absolute purification there. So, by purification only harmful impurities should be removed which are not good for health, but all the salts and that is needed for us, uh, you know, with respect to our health should be kept forward. The degree of purity uh, also depends upon its use. For example, the degree of purity required for domestic purposes is highest compared to purity of water which is required for civic uses like washing of streets and uh, gardening of your plants and trees and all. So, you do not uh, need any kind of purity there. Also, industrial usage also is totally dependent only on chemically pure water, but not you know highly pure water is only needed for domestic purposes. So, what are the different types of impurities that we see in water? 
in water we see two different types of uh, impurities and the <coughs> one method of understanding and analyzing this impurity is through suspended impurities, dissolved impurities and colloidal impurities. The second method is organic impurities, inorganic impurities and living organism. Both organic and inorganic type of impurities may be in the form of suspended, dissolved and colloidal. So, this also might fall under this category only. Now, what is suspended impurities? Suspended impurities basically might include silt, clay, algae, fungus, organic and inorganic matters as well as mineral matters. These remain in suspension because they neither settle down nor dissolve in the water and the concentration of suspended matter is measured by its turbidity. So, suspended impurities have an effect on uh, all these bacteria, algae and by <laughs> reducing their disease causing you know effect or by producing turbidity in order and color. The dissolved impurities, water is a very good solvent as we all know and can dissolve all kinds of salts in it when it comes in contact. Amount of dissolved salts is normally expressed in ppm and it is obtained by weighing the residue left over after evaporation with this water sample. So, whatever the water sample is, if you evaporate it and let it dry, then the amount of dissolved salts is seen and it is expressed. So, the dissolved impurities like calcium and magnesium which uh, cause temporary hardness of water for called as bicarbonates and carbonates might cause permanent hardness. We have sodium bicarbonate, carbon, sodium sulphate, sodium fluoride and sodium chloride which basically has effective uh, in terms of softening the water or by bringing in uh, foaming in terms of boilers or by our enamel of teeth mottling also happens through chloride we also have a change in taste. So, these kind of impurities are also needed for us with respect to all of this, but you have to be very careful when you are actually working on the treatment plant <coughs> in the treatment of water. <coughs> The dissolved impurities are basically in terms of metals and gases. There are various metals that are also available uh, or found in water like manganese, iron oxide which might have uh, you know effect on the water with respect to blackening or browning of water. Iron oxide might change the taste of water, might make it red, corrosive to metals and harden the water. Lead might create poisoning arsenic is also poison. With respect to gases, oxygen which is corrosive to metals, carbon dioxide is acidic and corrosive, hydrogen has the rotten egg odor and sulphide has corrosiveness to metals. So, we have to be very careful in terms of actually checking for only these kind of impurities. So, they do not come in contact with our potable water. Next colloidal impurities, collides are basically particles in a finely suspended state. So, they are neither in suspension nor in solution, but in a condition midway between suspension and solution. So, these impurities are not visible to the naked eye and cannot be removed by ordinary settling tanks. These are electrically charged and these remain in the motion and they do not settle. That is why their removal is very, very difficult. Most of the colloidal impurities are usually associated with organic matter containing diseases, producing bacteria and therefore form the main source of all sorts of epidemics. Most of the color of water is due to colloidal impurities only because if you see that the water is greenish, reddish, orangish, muddy, it is all because of colloidal impurities. Their quality is actually determined by the color test. The size of the colloidal particles is between 1 which uh, 2 1 millimicron or you know 3 mm to 10 to 6 mm millimicron. The organic impurities could be found in suspended vegetable and which is either changes the color, the acidity and taste of the water or dead animals which might produce harmful diseases or germs. Dissolved vegetable might produce bacteria, dissolved 
animal waste might cause pollution of water and produce disease germs. There is also living organisms in water. So, water available at the surface contains lot of living organisms. So, these living organisms are again divided into two divisions, plant life which is full of viruses, algae, fungi, you know bacteria and all. So, these are group of infection agents. So, you smaller than bacteria and they cause diseases of the throat, gastroenteritis, etcetera. Algae when present in large numbers cause turbidity as well as color in water. Bacteria is the cause of most of the sanitary problems. It produces diseases, objectionable odors and tastes. TB, typhoid, cholera, dysentery, gastric ulcer, pneumonia, diphtheria, plague, leprosy, gonorrhea are all causes of bacteria in the water. So, you have to be very sure of what kind of water impurities are found. And then we also have animal life like crustaceans, protozoa, rotifiers, worm, worms and larvae. So, if they are found and they are unsightly deposits are found in the water or either on the porcelain utensils or bathroom fittings, actually that is also where the water is supposed to be treated. Now, how do we analyze the water? Now, we know that there are various types of impurities in water and we also know the different types of impurities that we actually saw until now. Now, how do we analyze the water? So, for seeing and understanding the different types of impurities that are present in water, we can make an analysis of water. So, by analysis, we are going to understand the different types of impurities. We are also going to understand to what extent these impurities are present in the water and to what units are necessary to be installed at water works to purify this water. So, these are the three considerations that we have to see while analyzing it. First, try to understand type of impurities. Two, we have to understand what extent are these impurities present in them water and third, try to understand what are the necessary ways in which we can purify this water. So, this analysis is done first before purification as well as after purification. First, before purification is done to understand what was happening pre purification process and then post purification process is also done to actually test and analyze the water. So, analysis before treatment of water is very very essential for designing a water treatment plan and is done to understand whether the desired degree or standard of purification is achieved or not. To examine water, we have three different classes a physical examination where we can easily see it physically and try to understand if the water is pure or impure. Second, we have chemical examination where we are going to carry out a lot of chemical tests to understand whether it is total solids, chlorine test, hardness test, a pH value test, metal and chemical substances test, nitrogen and its compound test and dissolved gases all are test. The next is microbiological examination. Here we are going to understand as to what exactly made the changes in the water in terms of physicality also with respect to taste, odor, temperature, turbidity as well as color. And in terms of microbiological examination, we are going to see as to what kind of bacteria is present, examine the bacteria and aim it at determining whether it is fit for consumption or no. Or if there is biological examination, we have to see the presence of microscopic organisms which might affect the quality of water in terms of consumption. In terms of Indian standards of drinking water, we have certain parameters with respect to physical senses, chemical as well as understanding its pH levels after purification. So, we have to see if it is desirable or tolerable for us or fit for consumption or if no alternative source is available like the reverse osmosis level or desalination level, then what is the limit upon which the water can be extended for us for consumption. The bacteriological standards are basically 
understanding as to what exactly is the turbidity level in terms of uh, water either which is treated or untreated or even if there is any kind of unpiped water supplies and water which is in the distribution system if it is corrupted and if it is actually not able for consumption, if it is not fit for consumption, then we have to see how exactly we can work on the frequency of development of water and how what kind of sanitary protection we can give with respect to alternative sources of uh, <coughs> uh, you know um, distribution system. Then we have to also see as to what exactly does our country actually lay down with respect to standards of water. The next thing that we have to also realize is the hardness of water. Water when it is hardened it does not form any kind of lather when you know you when you hold the water in your hand with soap and that is called as hard water when there is no lather in it. So, hardness of water is due to the presence of soluble calcium, magnesium or any kind of iron compounds. So, the most common compounds are calcium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate calcium sulphate and magnesium sulphate. So, you have to see if the water forms lather or not. If there is lathering in your soap then that is soft water. If it does not have then such water should be worked in terms of dissolving all the salts that is in it. So, what are the different types of hardness that we see in water? One temporary hardness. Temporary hardness could be due to presence of soluble bicarbonates and when you know there is any kind of uh, bicarbonate of calcium or magnesium it is called as temporary hardness. This is when the water contains some kind of amount of sodium bicarbonate sorry soluble bicarbonate or calcium and magnesium carbonate they pass over the solids and they get dissolved and when rain water and distilled water are always soft because they do not have dissolved salts. So, all these salts are removed in all your distilled water and all your RO waters before you consume it. Temporary hardness is removed by boiling the water. When you boil your water all these presence of all the soluble bicarbonates is decomposed or if you add slaked lime to hard water all the insoluble carbonates are also formed. So, that is the fur or the scale when you uh, see it in your kettles, boilers, pipes and all you see one layer of lime right. So, that layer of lime is actually one may method of actually removing temporary hardness. Permanent hardness, this is due to the presence of chlorides and sulphates of calcium and magnesium. Such hardness can be removed by actually washing it through washing soda and the methods are lime soda process zeolite process and demineralization or deionization process. This removes both temporary as well as permanent hardness of water. And how is water treated? Water is treated with respect to a treatment plant and we have to actually understand treatment plant by seeing how good is the water for consumption. For potability water should be free from unpleasant taste, you know this or doors as well as must have that sparkling appearance that look in water when you know, see it in bislary bottles and all that. So, that water must be free from disease spreading germs, but when the water is available in you know with respect to all the various sources that we saw in the previous slides and all it contains various types of impurities and it cannot be directly used. So, what we do is we try to put the water in our treatment plants before we bring it forward for consumption. So, that amount of water totally depends on what kind of source are we taking the water from. So, settled water has less turbidity and suspended matter than the flowing matter. Objects of water treatment to remove the dissolved gases, murkiness and color of water, we actually treat water. To remove unpleasant and objectionable taste in odors, we treat the water. To kill all the germs, we treat the water and to remove hardness of water. So, these are the four different reasons for which water is treated and we bring it forward for the treatment process. So, there are various processes or steps which are involved in the 
process in the treatment plan. The first process is screening. Screening is just like uh, skewers okay, and it removes all the floating water which comes like for example, now in Mysore we are basically dependent on the Kaveri river. The Kaveri river from gravity falls down onto a water treatment plan and it flows down into the screeners first. So, it removes all the floating water, um, you know matter like leaves, uh, dead animals etcetera from the surface and it is provided at the right at the intake. Next aeration, the intake water lacks freshness and has higher percentage of carbon dioxide. To remove this and to increase the oxygen percentage, the water is first subjected to aeration by allowing the water to flow through fountains or cascades. Due to this, every drop of water comes in contact with atmospheric air and this process is called aeration. It is basically like you are shuffling the water again and then bringing the water in contact with air. When this happens, when you are shuffling it, the water comes in contact with atmospheric air and actually whatever water that lacks freshness has high, high amount of carbon dioxide, right. So, it reduces that amount of carbon dioxide. So, it allow, aeration basically allows the water to absorb all the oxygen from the air and gives out ex excess of carbon dioxide that is also makes the water fresh. This is, this is the second process after screening. So, it is adopted to remove the objectionable odor and also to remove the dissolved gases such as carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulphide, iron and manganese which are also present to some extent in the atmospheric content. Third is dosing of alum. Alum is then added, once it aerates, alum is added. So, when alum is added to the flowing water in one particular quantity, this mixture is thoroughly churned into a flash mixture. This causes the suspended and dissolved particles to get formed into flocus. This mixture is passed through a flocculator. So, flocculator comes in contact with alum uh, after the water is processed through aeration. Now, what is flocculation? What is flocculation? Flocculation is basically a chemical reaction of alum. There is formation of flocus as well as some of this flocus settles down at the base <coughs> from where it is drained off. <clears throat> Once it flocculates, next comes the settling and sedimentation. Now, after the water flocculates, it flows to the to a circular tank which is detained for about th 3 hours. So, there is water which is detained here and the excessive flocus and suspended impurities settle down in the tank and the base of these tanks in the form of sediment which is later drained off. Next comes filtration, then the water flows into the filtration tanks and these tanks are filled up with layers of sand, coarse sand, pebbles and water percolates through these three layers of sands and pebbles and filters of water takes place. Water which escaped to flocus and suspended impurities from the earlier process is here trapped by the sand and the pebbles and the layers of filtered clean water flows down towards the bottom of the tank. When that flows down, there we are actually fixing the water by passing through chlorine dose tanks where chlorine is mixed with clean water in a required dose to kill all the pathogenic bacteria and thus the water now becomes clean and healthy for consumption. And then this treated and pure water is then stored in pure water sums. Then comes the distribution pipes from where the water is sent through distribution pipes which are generally laid underground along the street. So, these are the 9 different steps which we see in a whole water treatment plan. First, it comes through the intake pipe right from a source, enters into your preliminary treatment where a protective bar screening is done. So, this screening removes all the leaves and the dead animals which would have been you know uh, seen in this water there. Once it screens, only the liquid passes through the screens. Once the li liquid passes through the screen, it falls into this low lift pump wells and then it starts aerating. 
Now, when it aerates through circular you know fountains and this one, all the water comes in contact with the atmosphere, removes all the oxygen and the water flows down before chlorination into coagulation. And now, the, here, here is where flocculation basically happens, it is basically like fumes, foams sorry foam. So, when the foaming happens, it flows down into the sedimentation basin and all the waste water which is unfiltered after this process stays back here and only the clean water enters into the filter, uh, filtering process. And this is where layers of sand, gravel and pebbles are put up and the water passes through all of this and the unfiltered water which would have come out again gets filtered and after the sand filtration and reaches the chlorination tank. Once it reaches the chlorination tank, this is where it gets clearer and purer and enters into the fluoridation process and then it is lifted through your pipe wells, sorry pump wells and enters into your storage towers. Once it enters into your water storage tanks or store, gets stored in your ground level reservoirs after which it is distributed through your distribution pipeline. So, this is the whole process of uh, typical layout plan of water treatment which basically happens in any city in any town and this is the common 8, 9 step process that you have to remember when water treatment is questioned. So, it is not very essential though to have all these purposes at all places, totally depends on what kind of quality of raw water that we get. For example, if we have um, raw water which directly comes from rivers because that is continuously flowing right. So, there we do not need aeration. In case of raw water which comes from lakes, screening and sedimentation are not required because we know all the suspended and floating debris are already settled in lakes. But aeration is must because lake waters have generally objectionable odor. But if raw water is obtained from deep wells, no treatment is required, only disinfection may be required and it is done and supplied to the consumers. So, we have to actually understand from where we are having our source of water and then depending on the character and degree of treatment, totally work on the treatment of the water or source. Now, where, where is this particular lo uh, uh, you know water treatment plan located? Location of a water treatment plant totally depends on the relative position of the source of water to the city. As far as possible, it should be located very close to the city. By such location, this water reaches the consumers immediately and chances of the contamination during transmission is very less. So, loss of head which happens due to leakages and also filling, fillers also is reduced and the top available, no, top layer of water becomes available to more people. In hilly areas, what uh, the best location is on top of the hill, so that the water flows down directly through gravity. If a city is located the banks of the river, it should be located near the source of water itself. So, with this, we complete quantity and quality of water also. Uh, thank you so much.